Matthew chapter four. I want to get back to some things we've discussed about what faith people look like, how we act. What does it mean to believe? And this is really back to basic discipleship here. First discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a faith person? Every Christian is a faith person because your whole life is centered around Jesus who you can't see. That means it's by faith. You received him because you believed something. That means you're a faith person. And so just like your salvation was obtained by faith, not by activity, everything else in your life can be received by faith, not by activity. Good word. We've, we obey God because we believe, not because we're slapped on the hand with a ruler. We live by faith. The justified people, the righteous people live by faith. So let's talk further about that. Here's basically the very first thing that Jesus ever did with the disciples. He called verse 18 and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately cast their nets or left their nets and followed him. We, we already explained the word immediately. It means immediately. <laughs> he said to them, follow me. And so if we just stop there at the follow me statement, follow me is the first thing Jesus is saying to people. Have you felt that? Yes. Some people signed up with Jesus to be saved, but they didn't know that he said, follow me. Follow me means follow me. And a lot of times people have started following Jesus and then before long, Jesus kept going and they're all distracted with life. Do we need to do the physical example? Object lesson? Okay, just pretend for the object lesson that I'm walking, following Jesus, and then he keeps going and then I, I'm busy with other things. Believing in Jesus, a lot of times people are believing in Jesus from afar. Have you ever felt that before? You knew you believed in Jesus, you just weren't anywhere close to him. That's what we're trying to avoid. Amen. Follow Jesus means to stay up close to him. Yes. All right? The only happy life is the life lived close to Jesus. Don't be somebody that meets him and then allows him to live a life without him or live their life without him. Follow Jesus means that we're close. All right? So let's uh, look. At, we're going to come back here in just a moment, but go to John chapter 6 with me. John chapter 6. If you're close to Jesus, you'll be delivered from sin. Amen. If you're close to Jesus, you'll find healing is right there next to you. If you're close to Jesus, you'll find joy is easy every morning. I said, if you're close to Jesus, you'll find that joy is there every morning. Yeah. You know, everybody just kind of wants to have a happy life, right? Everybody just wants to be content right now and tomorrow. Everybody wants to live with hope. You stay close to Jesus, you'll have hope. Everybody would prefer to be freed from anxiety. What's the secret? Stay close to Jesus. The problem with people's lives is they got a little too far from Jesus. In theory, I know you believe in him and he's in your heart, but in practicality, they got too far from Jesus because if you're close to Jesus, you're kind of happy. Isn't that right? So there's the answer. Just get close to Jesus. It's not about technicalities of how am I supposed to be religious enough? No, just stay close to Jesus. What does that mean? Well, without doing too much of the how-to, you need to, you need to care about his word and read it daily. You need to care about the Holy Spirit and follow him daily. You need to stay open to yield to the Holy Spirit. You need to pray in tongues so that you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Do that on a daily basis. Little Bible, little Holy Spirit time. Boom, you got it. Now, some of you have met happy Christians around here. Not just nice people because anybody can kind of be nice for a day. We're talking about happy looking, spiritual looking people. What's their secret? 
A little time in the Bible every day, a little time with the Holy Spirit every day, and then boom. That means you're walking with Jesus. That means you're close to Jesus. There's a lot more to it, but that's the basic secret to a happy life. So John chapter 6, he says something here. John chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. What's he saying? Well, he's trying to get them from Old Testament thought into New Testament thought. Old Testament thought was back here in verse 31. They, they're, they're trying to talk to Jesus about miracles and such. They say, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat because that's what it said in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was known amongst the Israelites that God gave bread from heaven. Speaking of the, the miracle manna that fed them 40 years in the desert. But here Jesus says, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. So the Old Testament again was a symbol showing that now Jesus gives you the bread from heaven. They thought they had the bread from heaven, but it was just a symbol. Now, in that symbol, you find some, some detail, which was manna came to them every morning. And they had to go gather some manna every morning. He didn't give them a week's worth at a time. It was every morning. And it was don't take too much, don't take too little, just enough for whatever you need. So that they could learn that God provides from, for them. So that we can learn that God provides for us on a daily basis. But the key word is, key phrase is daily basis. On a daily basis, God provides. He doesn't store you up a month at a time. Like you can't hang out with Jesus enough for the month in one day. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The bread of heaven is Jesus Christ. Then the rest of the chapter is wonderful. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Praise the Lord. All right, so if you get to Jesus and stay with him, you'll never hunger. What does that mean? We're not talking about physical. He's talking about spiritual and internal. So a lot of times people's life is determined by what they feel inside that they have or don't have. And so they're grasping at happiness, grasping at the world's way, grasping at substances, grasping at relationships that I must have, grasping at acceptance from people. Listen, if you'll just eat the bread of life daily, you won't have that hunger. You won't have that deficiency inside you. You won't hunger and you won't thirst because he fulfills everything. So you got to know that Jesus is everything. Well, I don't know what that would mean. I, I know that it's hard, but you have to believe it and then make a commitment to him. He said, follow me. You're just going to have to say, okay, I'm dropping this and I'm going to follow him and see what this does. They said to read my Bible every day, so I'm reading my Bible every day. How much Bible do you have to read? Oh my gosh, the whole Bible? No, just enough for today. Give us this day our daily bread. You got to eat every day or what? Or you're, you're angry at people. Every day, every time you fast, there's a moment where you're not real happy. If you don't eat spiritual food on a daily basis, you're going to go through these mood swings and everybody around you knows it. Isn't that right? Give us this day our daily bread. How much, how much bread do you have to eat every day? Just enough. What does that mean? That means when you read your Bible every morning, every night, a couple times a day, whenever, just read enough. Read until something hits you. Read until you're a little bit happier. Read until your spirit connects with it and says, Woo! <laughs> Makes me love Jesus again. Now I can go to work. Read a page, read a half a page, read three pages. Doesn't have to take long. Just have an open heart that says, feed me, God. 
Let me meet with you today. He's not saying go thou to seminary every morning and spend three hours and feel guilty if you don't. The problem is, if you go day after day after day without feeding, then you start thinking, I'm going to have to catch up. And so then you start feeling guilty because that one day you said, I'm going to study for four hours to make up for the past month. And you couldn't do it. You, you could only go about 15 minutes. Then you, you leave feeling guilty because you didn't read enough Bible. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to store up manna and you don't get to uh, make up for lost manna. Just going to have to pick up for the next day. The way to get back to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you feel like you've drifted, is pick up for the next day. Just a little Bible reading, just a little time with the Holy Spirit, and then do it consistently for about 21 days. This is how we live. And if you don't do this, listen, if you neglect your daily feeding on the bread of life and your daily drinking on the water of life, the great eternal fountains from within, then what will happen is after a month, after a year, after 10 years, if you've neglected daily feeding on the bread of life, you'll find yourself being a Christian who's quite unhappy. Good word. You'll be a Christian, but you'll be a little hopeless. You'll be a little bit more depressed. You'll be a little bit more irritable. You, you'll feel lost. You'll, you'll feel bored with Christianity. And some of you old timers know what I'm talking about. You've been through seasons. You recognize I'm getting a little bored with, with, with this whole thing. Once you've learned all the truth, it's like, well, I don't, you know, I already know everything. Listen, you'll get bored if you don't feed daily and hang out daily with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with the Father. Okay? This is a secret for your life. This is the secret for your life. People feel like they have all these needs and, oh, I need this and I need this. And, oh, I just need to, you know, I got all these problems from my past and my childhood and I got all this stuff and, you know, just the way I am. And I just need deliverance and I need help and I'm just broken hearted and all that. Look, what you need is Jesus. Amen. Stop focusing and chasing all the things you need. If you, if you receive Jesus and you're saved and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to just stay close to him. Amen. You're close to Jesus. All your problems disappear. Really, if Jesus was sitting right next to you in the chair, you wouldn't be thinking about any problems. You'd be like. <laughs> you'd be so in love with him. You'd be so happy just because you'd be so free because he's right there. And, and in his presence, there's fullness of joy. And in his presence, there's hope for eternity. And in his presence is all the deliverance and freedom that you need. Just hanging out with Jesus keeps you free. He said, you'd know the truth, the truth would make you free. You got to stay close to the truth. The problem is Christians are so easily lured into the world. They're easily lured into the world's hope, which is hopeless, into the world's way, which is ridiculous, into the world's catastrophes, which are unsolvable. You, you, you keep getting lured into uh, national problems. You might as well go hang out with your unsaved neighbor who's worried about it. There's a way to stay happy and free and clean and powerful. And it's to be close to Jesus. Close to his word. You read a few pages and it reminds you, ooh, follow him. He's expecting some things of me. Like he's expecting me to not worry. We dealt with that last week. What does that mean? What does do not worry mean? It means stop your worrying. Stop your anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. Think on only the good things. I mean, you could just take Philippians 4, 6 through 8 and just realize how ridiculous you've been in the past four hours. <laughs> Think on things that are true, of good report, pure, lovely. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't think about anything else. You don't get to think about evils or evils or anybody else's evils. Okay, 
Well, that's true Christianity. This is basic Christianity. Jesus says, follow me. Eat. And he goes on in this passage. This is where he says, you know, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And the, and the disciples at the time were just carnal. They're like, oh, this is too hard. We're taking off. You're going to have to partake of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to really get in there and, and wrap yourself in his soul, in his ways, Hallelujah. in his demeanor, Hallelujah. in his attitude, in his purpose. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's read, go back, go back a few verses to verse 27. John 6, 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Notice it says, labor for the food that does not perish, for the food that endures to everlasting life. How many of you have been working for natural food? We, we all have to put in 40, 50 hours a week, sure, if you're going to eat. So there is a amount of labor, but, he, but he's saying, don't let that be your focus. Rather, let your focus be for the one that gives everlasting life. Labor for the bread of life. That means put a little effort in for the bread of life. You know, a lot of times people, even Christians, can get hoodwinked into the love of money or working too hard or chasing money or trying to, it's almost like Christians hear the promise that God will prosper you and make sure you're full in every way. And so they go after it. They, they go after riches. Oh, don't you dare do that. No, that's not what he meant. Matter of fact, he said, don't even desire to be rich. Don't labor for that. Don't put your effort in that. Don't be thinking, oh, I'm going to get rich. God's going to make me rich. I'm going to get rich. God's going to make me rich. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, no, we have warning against that. Don't do that. Rather, put your effort in to pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Walk daily with the Lord. Let that be your fulfillment. Really, everybody's happy if they have a good meal. You prove that every day. You prove that every day. That's like sometimes the, the most exciting part of your day. And as soon as that exciting part is over, you're thinking about the next exciting part. Well, after about an hour, you're thinking, what are we going to do next? What are we going to do next? How are we going to eat next? How are we going to eat next? How are we going to... You got big plans for eating. You got big plans for eating. That's how you ought to be about Jesus and church things and spiritual things and conferences and, and conferences and special meetings and conferences and... And Bible reading time at home and prayer time with people and prayer time by yourself and witnessing time. And all of this is spiritual food. Jesus, you know, they looked at him one time and said, what are we going to eat? Jesus, he said, my food is doing the will of God. What, feeds Je what fed Jesus was that he was doing the will of God. You'll be able to skip a meal or two if you're doing the will of God. Doing the will of God just ends up being following him. James said, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. Jesus said, the wise man that built his house upon a rock is the one that hears my commandments and doeth them. How many wise ones do we have in here? It's the ones that hears everything he says and does it. Not just hears it. Not just attends meetings, but one, somebody that says, ooh, I'm going to do that this week. Good work. We preach on the love walk. Oh, man, real Christians say, ooh, that's a little bit hard, but I'm going to do that this week. Good work. Daily Bible reading? Oh, I'm going to do that. Praying in tongues? Oh, I'm going to do that. Why? Because Jesus said to. Because it's part of being close to him. Isn't that exciting? Come on, this is so simple. Isn't it so simple? It's so simple, but it's so real. It's where the supernatural life is found. Uh, go to John 15. We're close. Just go to John 15. 
So Jesus said, follow him. And if you follow Jesus, well, I mean, certainly we follow Jesus, but he wasn't all alone, was he? No, he's with the father. So we're following the father, be imitators of God as dear children. Remember that scripture? We're imitators of God. We're imitators of Jesus. We're imitators of those who follow Jesus. Paul the apostle said, follow me as I follow Christ. Or he said, really imitate me as I imitate Christ. The Greek word is mimic. Mimic me as I mimic Christ. Not in just form, but in everything. Okay, so here we see the secret to Jesus because Jesus didn't just do anything he wanted. And if we're following him, we're not just going to do anything we want. John chapter 5, verse What did I say? No. No, he was wrong. John 5. John 5. What's the big deal? Just another one. John 5. John 5, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And they'll show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Stop there. Just notice that Jesus on the earth was not just living his own life. He was doing what the father did. He was saying what the father said. So there's this element of your life that needs to be submitted to another. And yes, you need to be submitted to Jesus. But a lot of times people find, it, find themselves trying to mimic Jesus, but without that connection to the Father. Jesus helps you connect to the Father. So we could say it this way, the love of the Father needs to be in us. But to have the love of the Father in us, we need to be close to the Father and the Son. And I know it starts getting a little tricky. Well, which one is the Father and which one is the Son? Well, they're all the same. But don't try to follow Jesus by acting like Jesus without what Jesus had. What Jesus had was connection to the Father. What Jesus had was intimacy with God, the Father. Jesus actually had a daily prayer life. And so he was fruitful in his life. So uh, part of this is you and I honoring God and his holiness enough to partake of the love. A lot of times people have a love problem, but it's rooted in their lack for holiness or their lack of care for holiness. The Bible never really said, uh, be love for I am love. It said, be holy for I am holy. So there's this element that you and I have to commit to this holiness part of God. You commit to his holiness part, oh, the love of God will be much easier. Then you'll be able to bear some love fruit because you're committed to God. Bottom line is, abide in him. Stay close to the Father and the Son. Jesus was close to the Father. He prayed. We need to stay close to the Lord in prayer. How much prayer? Well, just all the time. All the time in union with God. All the time knowing that he's there. Maybe every once in a while, hello Lord, how are you? Just a recognition that it's all true. Even though you can't see him or feel him sometimes, most of the time, he's there and you acknowledge that. Then all of a sudden you start being led by the spirit better. You start hearing his voice more easily. You're conscious of him. If you were conscious of God in your life, conscious of the Holy Spirit in your life, conscious of the Lord Jesus sitting right next to you by his spirit, or we could say in you by his spirit, it would solve your crisis. Which crisis? All your crisis. Man, what do I have to worry about? Hallelujah. Rather than living a frustrated life. All right. Back to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, we got to follow Jesus. Matthew 4, verse 19. He's calling his disciples and he says, follow me and I will make you 
Start being good. No. Follow me and I will make you go to church. No. Follow me and I will make you. It's the only time in the Bible he said he will make you do anything. Did you know that? He's commanded us a bunch of things, instructed us, given us insight and principle. He showed us by example. It's the only time he said he would make you. In essence, you have a choice to follow Jesus. And if you follow him, you don't have a choice. He will make you fish. Okay? If you follow Jesus, he will make you fish for men. Good work. That's obviously win souls, not yeah. date. <laughs> it's interesting. The very first words that Jesus said to a disciple. Follow me. And I'm going to show you your purpose. Follow me. And here's what you're going to be doing. Good work. Just like any good job interview. He has called you to a Christian job. He began his disciples calling with purpose. He never called us to just be good Christians. Or be uh, less sinful people. He put purpose in in the very beginning. He had lots to teach, didn't he? I mean, he could have said, come and spend with three years with me so that you're ready. No, he started with purpose. He gave them the most important piece of discipleship. Without this, most, this first and most important part of discipleship, Christians will wander. You must allow Jesus to make you fish for men. Amen. I got two amens Amen. out of a few hundred people. Whoa. Can I get an amen, Brother Paul? Amen. Amen. You must allow Jesus to cause you to care about sinners. You must allow Jesus on a daily basis to show you and use you to help the world. I think this is one of the biggest problems in Christianity or in the churches is Christians. It's, it's the biggest, it's really the biggest problem with Christians getting lukewarm, bored, wandering, distracted. It's they don't know what their purpose is. Christian purpose is leading the next one. Christian purpose is not, what am I called to do, God? You know, I see the stage, I can't sing. I see the instruments, I can't play. I don't really want the microphone. Or maybe I do. Should I have the microphone? I wonder if I should have the microphone. Do I need the microphone? <laughs> Christian purpose is found in fishing for men. And you can fulfill it without a degree, without knowing your whole Bible. You can fulfill it today, tomorrow, and the next day. Everywhere you go. If you just allow Jesus to show you how to fish or we can say this, just start fishing. <laughs> just throw the bait. Well, I don't know if I know how to throw the bait. Uh, I'm, I'm, what if I throw it wrong? Just throw it. <laughs> this is how you get started. You don't get started by going to seminary school or, or six month training on, on soul winning. First, you have to commit to it. What do I mean? Commit to it. Yeah. Just commit to the first thing here. I read the book of Matthew and saw that that was in the beginning. I thought, oh, that's going to be part of the Christian life. Going to have to do that. Have you done that? Have you read this as part of your Christian discipleship? Yeah, just read it again. Read it again just to make sure you have. He said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. As a Christian, you're supposed to sit there and say, Woo, that's supposed to be part of my Christian life. Say it out loud. Say, woo! woo! That's supposed to be part of my life. That's supposed to be part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
Once you affirm that, you could say you're following Jesus now and you're going to have to start catching some people, at least fishing. I don't know if I do it right. What if I do it wrong? Is he going to, you know, like, like God's going to get mad at you for fishing wrong. He's going to be so ecstatic that you finally threw the line, threw the bait, threw the hook. But I'm not as good as the other people that throw the, that's only because they've done it more. Everybody can fish. <clears throat> Pretty easy, right? You're going to, it's going to be scary. It's scary for every single person that starts. It's scary, scary, scary. Everybody say it's scary, scary. but I'm not scared. I'm not scared. It's scary for every single person that tries to start talking about Jesus at first. It's scary for every single person at first. Okay. Maybe you're the big shot. That's not scared. It was scary for me. I was scared. I didn't want to do it. it when it came time to talking to us, a person about Jesus, I don't want to. And I made myself. You've heard me tell the story? How many of you have not heard me tell the story? I'm going to tell the story anyway. I'm a brand new Christian filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that I have a purpose. And part of that purpose is to help the next person get saved, healed, and delivered. Wasn't a minister, wasn't a preacher, wasn't a pastor. Had no idea that I was going to be. But I knew I had to obey Jesus because I wanted to be a good Christian. And so I was traveling in business. And uh, every Monday morning, I would, I would drive to the air. I would, I would hire this town car to take me to the airport. And then I would go work out, off, uh, out of the city every week. And I would fly back home every Friday, catch a cab back home every Friday evening. And so uh, here I am, my taxi cab ride. I'm one-to-one, face-to-face with a sinner. I don't know if he's a sinner, but how am I going to know? I mean, they don't have blinking lights on them that says sinner or Christian. <laughs> yes, but the spirit would let you know. No, that's not how it works. Don't over-spiritualize this, okay? And so here I am in the car with a, with a person that's probably uh, not saved. That's my, that's my assess- assessment. He's probably not saved. Uh, and if he is, we can just have a glorious party. So I better ask. Right. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Just ask, are you saved? That's why we put that on the pieces of paper. And so um, we drive away from the airport and it's about a 40, it was about a 45 minute trip where I lived at the time. And so here I am driving and, and I'm in the car and I'm, I'm discussing with myself <laughs> and the Holy Spirit. Well, should I say something or should I not? What if he's already saved, but what if he's not? What if he doesn't appreciate what I'm about to say? What if he does? And I would, I would do this. I would struggle within myself for about 35, 40 minutes of the trip, like hoping that it would go away. But there was this thing in me that said, you know, I would always get down to this final question, which was, what if he had a wreck today and died, went to hell when I could have got him saved before? I didn't want that to be on me. Now, that's pretty dramatic, but there's times when you ought to feel that. And so right about the last, you know, three to five minutes before my house, I would make myself say something. Didn't want to, scared to do it, never had done it before. Sir, do you believe the Bible? Or I would say, sir, have you ever been to church? Sir, do you know anything about God? I came up with all sorts of things. But this, you know, the first few times it was just, just get the door open, just say something. And uh, I did this Friday after Friday after Friday for about five months. Struggled every trip, finally b- cracked the door and had a discussion about the Lord. Every single time the door opened, I got to talk about God. Never did he kick me out of the car, slam the brakes, <laughs> make fun of me. This went on week after week after week. And I was trying, I, at the time when I started, I only knew like a couple scriptures. I only knew John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So when they would say, well, I'm Catholic or I'm Buddhist or I'm this or I'm that, I'd say, well, none of that really matters. Nobody gets to the Father by being those things. You must have Jesus. So I just preached the little simple thing that I knew. And of course, I'm learning more and more so I can add a little more conversation along the way. But after about five months, I recognized something. Um, Nobody had gotten saved. Now, this is one of the lessons you have to learn in following Jesus. Uh, Success does not mean they got saved. 
I was smart enough as a young Christian to recognize it doesn't matter that no one received. It only matters that I did my part. So you convincing somebody to be saved is not what fishing is. You can never, in the natural, if you go fishing, you can never make the fish bite. I've tried. <laughs> you can entice them to bite. You can pray that they bite. You can speak to them that they bite. But you cannot force them to bite. You have to make it look good enough to bite. And then you can say you went fishing. Same thing with soul winning. You cannot make them get saved. That is not your job. Only God can open a heart and cause them to want to be saved. Your job is to throw the bait. Your job is to throw the bait. After five months, I look at a little assess, took a little assessment of what had happened. Nobody had gotten saved, but a miracle had taken place. I had gotten free from fear. It took me five months to get free. Many times, how, do you know, how, how did I know I was free? Because I could start preaching at the airport. I didn't have to struggle for 40 minutes. Just open the, sit down. Sir, do you believe in God? Just right off the bat. And sometimes I got to talk the whole time. Sometimes I could tell the door was closed so I didn't have to talk anymore. But I was free. I had allowed the truth of Jesus Christ to give some compassion to me, to care enough about a stranger to ask. That's all. That's all that really happened. It took me five months to get free. How long will it take you? What happens with a lot of Christians, they try a couple times, usually with family or friends who slam their face in the door, door in their face, and then it's like, oh my gosh, I guess I'm not called to this. Oh, I don't know how to do this. Don't start with family and friends. Amen. Start with people you don't know. Amen. I mean, we start banging all of our people with the Bible. It's natural, so I'm not telling you not to. But, but get good quick. Become a good fisherman quickly. And with those around you, recognize that, you know, they don't see you as Mr. Holy or Mrs. Holy. They see you as the one they used to know last month. And all that's different is now you dress up a little different on Sunday morning and go somewhere that I won't want to go. Every one of you in this room must get through the walls of fear that stop you. Or we could say the walls of carelessness. Good work. The walls of being compassionless about your fellow humans who may go to hell. It is your job. It is the reason you're still in the earth. If the Lord didn't need us to help the next person get saved, you could have gone to heaven the day you got saved. What's the use of earth life if it's not to reach other humans? And that doesn't mean just get them to Jesus, but also get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Get them to church if you can. Get them discipled if you can. Give books out. Point them to the right places to get taught. Whatever it takes to help them become good Christians. Why? So that they can go back out and do the same thing. So you have to remember the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose is not just attend. It's get equipped so that you can go out and bring the next person. Why? So I can become a good Christian. Why? So that I can be a giver. Why? So that I can walk by faith. Why? So that I can be holy. Why? Eventually the last why is why? So that I can help the next person go through the same thing. So that I can help the next person into the family of God. Is this reaching the back row? This is where Christian purpose is found. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a fisher of men. Well, I can't talk so well. Okay, I can't talk so good. You don't have to talk good. Because in the talking is the Holy Spirit. All he needs you to do is open your mouth. Open your mouth and he can do the convincing. There, there's so many tips. Of course, most of you have the book, The Call of the Christian. The reason that I wrote the book, The Call of the Christian, is to give Christians their purpose. 
Sure, there's several things in life you may be called by God to do. Part of it is how you relate to the body of Christ, your position in the body, your place in the body. But as a Christian, we all have the same purpose. Some people say, well, I'm called to win souls. Well, everybody else is called to win souls too. So don't let our outreach be the, well, those are the outreach called people. Everybody's called to be a fisher of men. Whether you throw the bait well or not. It's like somebody fell overboard off the ship. Can somebody throw the donut? Can somebody throw the little thing with the rope? You ever seen those? Can you just throw the little donut thing? Well, I don't don't know if I can throw the donut thing. I haven't thrown it before. I don't know know if I throw it very well. If I don't throw it very well, we'll just pull it up and throw it again. Uh, But I don't know. I mean, we got some professional throwers around here. Can we get some? Can we get some professional? Could y'all hush up and somebody just throw the dope because throw the, the donut because somebody's going under. Somebody's dying going under. Can you just throw the and if you don't throw it well enough, we'll try it again because they're dying. And if you don't throw it and you're the closest to the donut thingy, then same thing with soul winning. Just try it. Try it. A lot of it's just you telling your all you're doing is telling a story. Y'all do that all the time. You folks tell, us, tell all sorts of stories about all sorts of things. I mean, you can tell a story about, you know, fast food restaurant. You know, well, you hear, hear what happened to me at the fast food restaurant? Why don't you hear what happened to me about Jesus Christ? Hear, hear what happened the other day I got say. Just tell somebody the story. See if they believe your story. And if they don't believe your story, don't argue. I just, I just got in a conversation this past week with a, with a uh, I don't know what you'd call him, but he affirmed that there was a Jesus Christ that walked the earth, but it had, had, didn't want to have any part of religion and such and felt like it was all kind of the same deal. And I, I told him, I said, well, do you know what Christians actually believe? Do you, do you know what? He said, oh, he said, he said, I've argued with Christians before. I'm thinking, well, I ain't going to argue with you. I said, do you know what Christians really believe? He said, well, I don't know that, you know, the blah, blah, blah. I said, well, here, just let me tell you the quick story. I said, here's the whole deal. The whole deal is that all humans are born in sin and are separated from God. But God had a plan and he sent Jesus. And I went through the story. He sent Jesus to die for our sins and he died for your sins so that you could be saved, have eternal life and be joined back together with God. If you want that, you can be saved. And I said, and since you, you believe in Jesus, you said you believe in Jesus, you're not far from salvation. Just, I told him the simple truth and he didn't bite. I'm just waiting for him to bite. When was the, have you ever been fishing? How many of you have been fishing like this? Come on, come on. When did you go like this? When did you set the hook? When you felt the nibble. When the cork went under. You don't pull the thing until you feel the nibble. So I was just fishing, just telling the story to see if he believed it and see if he wanted to be saved. And he didn't. End of conversation. I'm happy. I finally did it. I told him. Go about your life. You do the bait casting and the seed planting and let God do the supernatural part of the convincing and the drawing near and the hooking. The only real tip that you need to understand, because I know a lot of people that have started doing the talking and they, they, they've expressed to me how, you know what? I feel like I can talk about Jesus and, but I I never know how to, to finish the deal, close the deal, set the hook. I never know how to really get them. And so here's your tip. Are you ready? Because you, you people can talk. I know. One-on-one, every one of you can talk. You may not be called to be an evangelist. You may not be called to stand in a pulpit and preach to a bunch of people, but you can certainly talk one-on-one. You do it all the time. So in your one-on-one conversations with people, you just need to know what you're looking for. And if you don't know what you're looking for, just ask the person, do you believe what I just told you? Do you believe that about Jesus, that he died for you, that he's the son of God? Just ask them, do you believe what I just told you? And if they say, "Uh uh-huh, then you say, do you want to be saved? And if they say yes, then you can help them. If they say, I don't know, I don't know about that, then you can't really help them. Or you can do what Paul and Jim do. They just say, well, pray with me anyway here. <laughs> you can kind of force save them. Some people will respond that way. They're, they're him hawing around. The devil's keeping them from jumping 
from taking a leap. And so they just need a little shove. Here, just let me pray for you. God, help them. Okay, say this after me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. Save my soul. Thank you. Amen. They just need a little help. Now, if they pull their hand away and say, I'm not saying that, that's another story. But you can kind of force save them. I know some of you, I don't like that. Well, the main thing is you, you ask them if they want to be saved. That's all you do. And if they, if they want to be saved, then you lead them. If they don't want to be saved, then you don't. Pretty easy, right? Uh, force saving does work sometimes. I've met people. I have two personal friends that both became ministers. Both prayed and they didn't want to. They prayed to get the person away from them. <laughs> both became ministers. They only said those words to get the person to leave them alone. Don't ever underestimate the power of God's word spoken out of a human mouth. He can do supernatural things you and I can't do. It's not about how well you argue the points. Matter of fact, if you ever find yourself in an argument with a sinner, go find something else to do. And don't learn the hard way. We all, we all usually learn the hard way, even if we're told to not learn the hard way. I remember I was in New York City one time on the streets. We were witnessing, talking to people about Jesus. And I ended up talking to this Muslim guy. And I'm uh, standing there and, and realizing, he, you know, I, I kind of know where he's coming from. And so I'm arguing my side. And he's arguing his side. And, uh, and my friend, Angelo Metropolis, who was my mentor kind of in the Lord and ministry, uh, he walks by and he says, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I can get him. I can get him. You know, I can get him. And so I spent five minutes with him, 10 minutes with this guy, 20 minutes. And, and the rest of who are with our group, they're kind of walking around. And I see my friend Angelo walking by again. He's like. And I'm thinking, no, I'm going to win this one. I'm going to win this one. And after about 20, 25 minutes, I finally caught up with the group. And Angelo said, uh, how'd you do with that guy? I said, he's a Muslim. He, he wasn't, he wasn't, in. he goes, yeah. He said, um, while you were stuck with him, there was like several hundred people that were walking by that you could have ministered to. We do want to care about one. At the same time, when they're closed, be sharp to recognize it. Don't waste your time. Don't cast pearls before swine. It, it'll, it'll make you feel bad and it won't get the job done and you'll waste your time. Amen. So there's lots of little tips like this that you'll learn if you'll get started. Amen. The problem is a lot of people have tried and been turned down and then quit. Not if you're a follower of Jesus, just be, your, be, be doggedly determined. I've been turned down way more than you. Remember the story of um, the lady uh, in Germany? It's in my book, but this lady in Germany, uh, it's an older story, but she uh, walks by this uh, park bench and there's a homeless fella sitting on the bench and uh, maybe a drunkard and she hands him a gospel tract and he looks at it and he, and he throws it down and curses at her. And she is so stunned and she walks away and she's very grieved and very sad and um, very depressed and, and basically never preached again, never, never did it again. She was so distraught that someone had rejected her so harshly. Well, what she didn't know is that as she walked away, the wind blew that piece of paper to the man and he kicked it the other way. The wind blew it back to him. He picks up the piece of paper and reads it and gives his life to Jesus. He becomes a preacher. He begins traveling around Germany for about seven years, preaching the gospel. And every church he went to, he told that story, looking for the woman. Well, at the end of one service, she comes down. She says, that was me. She said, and I want you to know something. I'm so ashamed. I've never witnessed again since then. I was so distraught. Don't let that happen to you. Come on, you, you people out there, you need to go get rejected 25 times. I prophesy if I need to, you need to go re get rejected a whole bunch out there. 
Tell everybody about Jesus. Get rejected a whole bunch. Be a real Christian. You know better than Jesus, he got rejected. He was rejected by men. A man of sorrows. Be like the apostles. They got rejected left and right. Thrown in prison, beaten, scourged, made fun of, spit on. I've never been spit on. You ever been spit on? I've never been spit on. You've been spit on? Glory to God. Y'all need to get some spit. That'll help you decide if you're a real Christian or not. I haven't been spit on, but I have had, had people blow smoke in my face. Does that make you mad? I'm like, no, 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 it don't matter. Can you feel that this is uh, like real Christianity? Yes. Can you feel like this is, this is kind of like what Christians ought to be doing? Yes. T.L. Osborne said back in the 70s, he, had, he said, while Christians were beating a path to the sanctuary, Jehovah Witnesses were beating a path to the sinners and they made converts. There's no reason Jehovah Witness churches should have anybody in them, much less be full. It's because they go after people. They go fishing. I hear that on Sunday mornings, what they do in their church is nothing about glorifying God. It's all about how to get the next person in so they can get their money. They spend all their time training how to make a convert out there. The church, at least this, I mean, just, this church may be a little bit different, but most churches don't spend any time helping Christians live their purpose. And we got the real purpose. Usually when we talk about soul winning in a church, everybody's like, I'm sure it's for that guy and that girl. But not here, right? Is everybody convinced? Do we need ushers to go get a pack of tracks out there for everybody? I think we do. We, we We need everybody in here to have a pack of gospel literature when you leave the building. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me give you a couple motivators and then we'll be done. My friend Daniel King is a a missionary. He's one of the missionaries that we support. Uh, He's a soul winner. He was in a swimming pool one time, he said, with his friends. They were swimming around and he said he got next, he got near the light that was on and he said he started feeling an electrical shock. And he was so alarmed because there was other people in the pool He jumped out of the water and he started shouting and hollering at everybody, get out of the water, get out of the water, get out of the water. It's dangerous. There's electrical short in the water. And he was doing his best to save everybody from getting killed. You and I need to understand there's a hell. If you knew there was a hell, wouldn't you tell people to avoid it? If you really believe there was a hell, wouldn't you spend a little of your time this week to tell somebody? Or is it not your responsibility? Is it our responsibility? Is it? I mean, Jesus called you so that you could fish for people. Or did he? Did you realize that in Acts chapter 1, It says, Jesus said to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you so that you can be good Christians in church and do a lot of Holy Spirit things. No, he said, you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses to me all around the world. The first purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make you be a witness. So if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you must be a witness. You must go after all the people that you know, all the people that you don't know. Show is quiet in here. You'll be a happier Christian. You'll be a much happier Christian. I said you'll be a much happier Christian. 
The soul winners are the happiest people on earth. The truth is the channel, the channel of life has two ends. One end is open toward the Lord. You got that. The other end is open toward sinners. And if you don't have that other end open, you'll become the Dead Sea. You'll receive everything from just like over in, in the Middle East. The Dead Sea has water coming in, nothing going out. It's dead. If you'll open up toward sinners you'll have some free flow in life going through you. Amen. Happiest people are the soul winners. Amen. If you're not happy today, go lead someone to Jesus. All of a sudden, you'll remember how happy you feel. Amen. Watchman Nee said, there's two great days in the life of every believer. The day in which he believes in the Lord. Was that a good day for you? Yeah. And then he said, and every day after that in which he leads somebody else to faith in Christ. Hallelujah. What does it do? It refreshes you. It reminds you, oh, wow, eternity is real. Wow, the angels are rejoicing. That was wonderful. I felt like I did something for God. Every Christian wants to do something for God. There's lots to do for God. There's nothing greater than leading the next person to Jesus Christ. Everybody stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Come on, get some attention on somebody else besides yourself. Your problems disappear. Get your attention on somebody else that may be going to hell. All of a sudden, you'll feel like you're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus said that, or the scripture says that, that pray ye one for another that you may be healed. You start giving life to somebody else, You'll receive life. One of our goals is to make sure the Christian is not stuck. I drew a picture a long time ago of a circle being the believer and arrows pointing in. We get saved and we start learning the truth and it's like, oh, I can get healed. I can get joy. I can get finances. I can get good relationships. Ooh, I can have peace in my life and hope in my life. And all of a sudden you realize all the arrows are pointing in. What if the believer turned the arrows out? I want to give some hope to somebody, give some peace, give some finances. I want to be a giver of salvation, a giver of love. All of a sudden you see the purpose of a Christian. It's not to just receive, receive, receive. It's to give, give, give. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. So let's practice. Y'all ready to practice? All right. Now, what we're going to do in the room here is I want everybody to turn to somebody and don't turn to your spouse or the one you came with if you can, or if you can avoid that, turn to somebody in your row or behind you or in front of you and look them in the eye. And both of you are going to ask each other. So you're going to ask them, <laughs> ask them this. I, I, okay. Go ahead and find your partner. Go ahead and find your partner. Ask them this. Say, do you believe in God? Okay. Now, both of you are going to be doing this. Now, be real quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. Be quiet. This is training time. This is training time. I don't have time for six months of this. You get two minutes training. Say this. Say, let me tell you. Jesus is the son of God. God sent him to die for your sins so that you could be saved, forgiven, and go to heaven. Do you want to be saved? Okay, now we're not done. We're not done. Now, now pretend that they say, yes, I want to be saved. Say, okay, then say these words out loud. God, save me. I believe in Jesus. Forgive me of all my sin. Amen.
All right. We can now do better than the Jehovah Witnesses. Now there's more. Hey, if you forget, we have it on paper. You can simply open the paper up and say, pray this out loud right here. And they're reading it. Say, no, no, say it out loud. Go ahead. Say, God, I believe in Jesus. And you just make them say it. You're going to get started this week? Come on, God needs you to. God needs you to. Yes.